Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Mark Toma. Mark is a professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Oregon. Mark's research has focused on monetary economics, time series analysis, and the political business cycle. He writes regularly for the Fiscal Times and CBS Money. Mark is probably best known for his blog, The Economist View, one of the original and premier economic blogs that helps shape the national conversation on economic policy questions. Paul Krugman once said that Mark's blog is, quote, the best place by far to keep up with the latest in economic discourse. Welcome to the show, Mark. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yes, we're glad you're here. So let's begin, as I do with most of my guests, by asking, how did you get into macroeconomics? Well, in grad school, I was sort of torn between doing micro and doing macro, probably leaning a little bit towards micro, particularly IO. I really like that topic. Mm Mm-hmm. I was at not the best grad school in the country, and my dissertation advisor, who was a micro person, actually explained that if you come out of here, say, in I.O. or labor, you're going to be in competition with all these people from Michigan and all these places, and you know you just probably won't do that well in the market. But there's this other thing, time series econometrics, that really seems to be in shortage out there. So, And I was interested in money issues anyway, very interested and so I decided to do that instead, and I think it was a good decision. He was actually right. Uh, there was quite a bit of demand for time series sorts of issues at that time. Uh, monetary neutrality was also a big issue, and that's something I was interested in. So I, I applied time series econometrics technique, Vare models, causality, Granger causality, that sorts of thing, to the issues of um, monetary neutrality. Yes, you would call yourself an econometrician, right? Mostly, yes. That's mostly what yeah. I've done. You've done a lot of Go ahead. Yeah, mostly just applied that to various questions I've, I've been interested in, but mostly it's been about issues of re, around the Fed. Okay. So that speaks to the influence of professors, right? I mean, that's quite a, a change in <laughs> career path. Um, yes, yes, it was. I, You know, I was torn between the two. I don't think I had a strong, I, I just liked the economics. I don't think I had a strong preference mm-hmm. for one over the other. And so I was just looking for something kind of a lost grad student, you know, my, my third year. <laughs> well, little did your professor know the uh, path it would take you on to one day being here on the show. So yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're all uh, grateful for your professor's uh, career advice. Well, let me talk about your blog since it is so prominent and uh, has really, you know, done a lot for the conversations that we've had on, ha- had about economics over the past few years. So let's begin by asking, how did you get into blogging? Um, it was right after Bush was reelected, and there were a couple of things going on in my mind. Um, one, I was really unhappy with the way economic issues have been covered in the press, mm-hmm. and, and particularly issues involving Social Security and tax cuts and whether they paid for themselves and all those sorts of things that were big back then. And so I thought maybe somebody, you know, first I wrote it, three <laughs> letters to the editor, and then I wrote a couple of op eds for the local paper, and then one day, I just decided I was going to start a blog. The other thing that was going on in my head was I had felt that during the election, so this is a little bit political, that the Democrats had been pigeonholed as anti-market and and people who just really didn't like capitalism. And so I wanted a voice out there saying, no, look, these issues involving regulation, market intervention to, say, cure market power or overcome market power, Issues involving social insurance have a strong grounding in economics. I mean, there's, there, there's, there's actual economics that can support these points of view. And I didn't feel like there were enough voices out there that were, you know, making that case. And so we had lost the middle. And that, you know, I didn't have any idea when I started the blog. When, I just did it one day. That, what year did you start? Oh, gosh. It, it's been, it was in 2005, I believe. Okay. Um, so I think it's about 11 years ago now. <clears throat> so one day I just started it and um, I had no idea it would turn into anything. My idea was if, if I could just convince one person, you know, <laughs> I was doing my job. If everybody got out there and became an advocate for, for these things and sort of convince mm-hmm. one person that, that Democrats weren't crazy anti-market types of people, and maybe you could have some influence on the press and get the coverage better. And I, I really think that 
the influence of blogs on the press has been underrated. I think it's very, very different from when it was back then. They listen to us. They've really changed how they cover things. And there's a strong interaction between academics and press that I didn't see at that time. And many, many more voices um, are, are listened to. That, that you know, at, at that time, there were just a few people that always showed up in the press. I seemed to call one or two people in the, mm-hmm. in the country. And I, I just think that now there's a lot more people that, that have a voice and, and I think that's important. But anyway, so, and then somehow, mainly through um, Brad DeLong and Paul Krugman, um, it really got to be known, and, and here we are today. Now, when you started blogging in 2005, there were a few other blogs back then I can, it comes to mind. So uh, I think uh, the Freakonomics blog was around back then, Marginal yeah. Revolution, but I don't recall any macroeconomic uh, blogs at the time. Am I correct? Were you the only one? Um, no, there were a few, I think. There was, okay. Brad DeLong was out there. He'd been out there for a long time oh, and he right. was doing macro yeah. issues. There was a blog called Angry Bear. It's still around, but it was very different back then. It had a completely different set of contributors. They did a lot of macro issues. There's a couple of blogs that have sort of died that were also contributing on macro. I think Andrew Samwick, who's macro, but he looked at macro, or micro at macro issues as well, social insurance issues. And there, there were a few others that were, were out there, but it was pretty thin at that time. Okay. Now you did this um, as an associate professor, right? And so you had to balance your research responsibilities, your teaching responsibilities, along with your blogging. And your blogging took off. I mean, it, it became prolific. Um, you're well known for it. So how did you handle that, that uh, tension, the, those trade-offs there, trying to do all three? Yeah, and at the beginning, it was almost, a, in fact, it was a negative. I mean, I, I remember one of the faculty members in our department sitting down in my office and saying, you should stop doing this because it's going to hurt you. you know? hmm. I, said, I said, that's what 10 years for. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it, it was difficult at first. Fortunately, mm-hmm. my kids were all gone and I had a lot of time. And so I could sort of um, keep up research at that time and also do the blogging without having one significantly affect the other. Over time, I very much, my research has gotten crowded out more and more. And in my particular case, I'm not sure that's such a bad thing. I mean, to be honest, I don't think I would have contributed more than marginal sorts of changes in the profession on the research side. And so this has been a way to get, I have way more recognition from the best people in their profession than I ever would have had and way more influence in terms of the types of ideas and the types of questions that people are addressing. So in that sense, I think it's been a a good thing in terms of the impact on the profession more than I would have had from research. But it, it was difficult at the first. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time each day doing the blog, um, probably all day, every day. I haven't, I haven't missed a day since I started 11 years ago posting. Wow. Something. And, and so it, it's, it's taken a lot of time and, and slowly over time, it, it has crowded out research. And mm-hmm. I, I don't know how to think about that. It's part of me feels guilty. And sometimes I think you need to just get back to it more than you have. And other times, given the feedback I get and the, you know, people telling me the impact it has on the profession and how much they appreciate it. I think, well, this is what I ought to be doing. And so it, it, it's a bit of an internal debate that I have with myself. Well, I've found, you know, following blogs and participating myself to be very useful in terms of coming up with ideas for new research, for learning what are the hot topics out there. So I, I do think it's useful for, you know, young professors who are, you know, finding their way, um, even going for tenure. But there is this issue of making sure that you're getting, you know, the proper publications. But I wonder if, as as time goes on, if some of those expectations will change, right? So if you do have a really influential blog like Mark Toma, will that count for something as opposed to just a a peer-reviewed academic article? Any thoughts? (laughs) Well, in I can speak about my case. It, at first, it didn't. And as I said, I think the department probably was just, oh, gosh. But over time, as it caught on and, and more and more, it, it, one thing that really made a difference is people would go out and give papers and they'd hear about the blog. And it's like, okay. wow, so, so this is an impact. Mm-hmm. And so when I promoted to full professor, it actually was part of my tenure case 
And I did get recognition from the dean and others. And sort of I said, does this mean the university is endorsing me doing part of, you know, using part of my time to do blogging? And they said, yes, this is what it means. And so in that sense, I don't feel as guilty about letting it substitute for research. They, they found some value in it. On the other hand, like when Noah Smith was still a graduate student and he started blogging and wanted me to start um, promoting some of his stuff, I made him get permission from his dissertation advisor that it was okay because I didn't want huh. it to get crowded out. In my sure. own department, they have difficulty. They, wa- they, they want to give me credit. But they don't want to create incentives for young people to think sure. that this is a path where they can get enough credit to get tenure. Because it's simply the, the, the ethic is it's your research, purely and simply, that's going to get you tenure. And maybe at the margin, this makes a bit of a difference. But, and it's also difficult for them to come up with metrics. You know, do you get outside letters? Exactly how do you evaluate the impact of a blog? And so they don't know how to measure it. <clears throat> And so they don't. So they want to give me credit, but they don't want to create bad incentives for younger people in the department to think that this is a way in which you might be able to, um, you know, a path to tenure or helping your tenure case if it's on the margin. You know, if you have that choice between starting a blog or doing one more paper, you better do one more paper. That's the message they want to send. And I think that's the norm everywhere. I I, I think I think so too. Yeah, yeah. I, I did interview Miles Kimball on the show earlier. And and he believes, though, the future is different. He believes that at some point, or maybe even we're gradually getting there, that uh, departments will look at blogging. In fact, he makes the case that you know, some of the successful departments today are ones that have professors who do blog. Someone like you, um, Tyler Cowen, um, Miles Kimball himself, the University of Michigan, because he, he believes it attracts grad students to their programs. That, you know, In addition to having a solid research agenda, having some notoriety for being a blogger. So it'll be interesting to see how this all unfolds going forward. Um, it, we, we have gotten grad students because of the blog. Oh, okay. There's, there's no doubt about it. We've also gotten donations to the department, not big ones, but, but things like that. So there are certainly impacts. What I'd like to see departments do in the, in the future is start. When I first started my blog, I actually didn't make it just for myself. The, the apostrophe and economist view was outside the S. I wanted to be collective. So I went around to the department and said, look, we're all experts in various things. When there's important public issues, let's use this blog of a way of of letting the public, letting the press and others know, here's what economics has to say about these issues. And, um, you know, you don't have to do it every day, but, you know, every once in a while when a topic comes up in environmental things or labor things or whatever your particular international, whatever your specialty is, why don't, why don't we go out there and, and start giving our department a voice? But no one else was really interested in doing it, so I moved the apostrophe over and, and did, it, <laughs> did it alone. That's interesting. But, but um, I'd like to see departments have department blogs where everyone who does a research paper is also required to, to explain it to the public or explain it to at least to other people in the profession. Here's what this paper is addressing. Here's why it's important. Here's what it has to say about policy or, or whatever it is the, the paper's addressing. That doesn't work for all papers, purely theory papers that make minor you know, changes in the assumptions needed to show this or that. But I think in a lot of cases, particularly like our department, where most of our issues are applied theory and, and a lot of, of data work, you know, what is it that you're saying? Why is this important? And I think that would be a really valuable thing for departments to do. Yeah, I talked to John Cochran also on the show in a, in a previous episode, and, and he had mentioned some highlights from blogging because he does that quite regularly, as you know. Yes. And he mentioned uh, he was tinkering around in one of his early Neo Fisherin uh, posts and that uh, Michael Woodford saw it and picked it up and, and did a paper based on one of um, John Cochran's posts. And John Cochran found you know, great joy in that, he told me. He felt, you know, this is a, a, an outlet where he could put something out there that wasn't really fully developed, but was, you know, partly there and some other academic picked up on it. And so he, he, you know, gave an example there where it was useful and he found it productive for his own research efforts, even if it wasn't a formal paper. So I, I do think we see some of that. And I, I, and like, as you said, um, the impact on policy discussions is immediate, right? It's, it's real yes, time. Yeah. And there's lots of examples we've talked about in the show before, um, the discussion over TARP, I remember that being influenced by bloggers, uh, discussions about QE programs, real-time feedback from, from folks. I'm sure you can come up with many other examples. Given no, your- I, 
I was told directly that the people doing TARP were at the Treasury were very much monitoring blogs and it had a huge impact on the way they thought about issues. So I think that was an important thing. I think, I think um, one place blogs have a lot of value that papers can't provide is in what I call sort of real-time economics. When these issues hit that are important and policymakers have to make an immediate choice, I think blogs are a great way to provide that immediate feedback and to say, here's what the profession knows, here's what we don't know, here's some ideas, you know, maybe they're not fully developed and cooked, we'll, we'll start working on the papers now, but here's what we're thinking about. And I think that's a really important thing that economists can do through blogs. Let me also add that I had a similar experience in terms of a graduate student coming up to me and saying, one of the posts that you put up on your blog, it, wasn't, it was something that I had taken from somewhere else and just excerpted, but it... it gave me a dissertation idea and he was really thankful for that you know he was struggling to find an idea and there it was suddenly for huh. him so oh that's been fascinating um <laughs> let's ask how do you actually do it all right so let's, let's talk about the mechanics of it when you get up in the morning or do you even sleep <laughs> maybe that question <laughs> yes. okay you do sleep great so uh, how does the typical day start for mark toma so the first thing i do when i get up is well, I look at my email. If there's anything I have to answer, I, I do that, but I mostly set it aside. And then I go to my RSS feed. I use a very old RSS reader that I think is really efficient and better than the ones other people are using called um, Feed Demon. And I monitor oh, three to 400 feeds and I just start going through them. And it's just a first cut. And I click on anything that I, that I like and it goes up as a tab on, on a browser and I leave it there. And so the first hour or so is spent simply going through all the RSS feeds, scanning as fast as I can. This looks interesting. This looks interesting. This doesn't. And putting it up. And then I go through those more carefully, either scan them or read them. I don't I actually fully read everything, I'll have to admit. But I at least scan everything for the main ideas and whether I think it's going to be of interest to you know, I think there's there's several groups that I think about, the academics, the press, and the general public, and I try to serve all three. And so does this have an audience? Is it, does it have something that people are going to be interested in? If so, it makes a cut. If not, I delete it. And then I pretty much do that all day long to try to keep up and not let that RSS feed get out of control because, you know, there, there's a lot of a lot of uh, things that come up in the feeds all day long. So most of the day is spent as a struggle trying to keep up with the <laughs> RSS feed. And, um, and then once I get that first group up, I try to do a set of posts. I try to do three a day. Today I've only had one and I'm feeling guilty. I got to get two more, but I just haven't found anything yet that I, that I want to put up. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so then I start putting things up. Then I turn to, I have a lot of deadlines that I have to meet, you know, for columns and the articles at, C, at CBS. And the biggest struggle for me is finding ideas. So if I can come up with an idea, I, I, I try to work on that stuff and get any deadlines met that I have to meet. And then I turn to the school stuff. You know, I, I, I teach a lot in my coursework try to get that done and then any research or other sorts of things I'm doing. And then at night I come back to the blog and every night at 10 o'clock I post the links for the, for the next day. Sometimes it's a little later than that, but wow. that's, that's so, pretty much how it works. Each, so each you got day. blog on the mind all day then, huh? You yeah, it's all day, every day, it, pretty much from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed. That's, that's what I'm doing for the most part. Sounds exhausting. Now, how do you, how do you uh, filter out, um, you know, new additions to the blogosphere, new new sites, because there's constantly new people joining. Of course, there's there's probably some who are leaving as well. But uh, you know, how do you find new quality talent when it does emerge? Um, some of it comes by email. Hey, I've got this blog you haven't ever linked mm -hmm. to. How about you link to it? So quite a bit of it comes to me that way. Okay. People are people are pretty willing. I used. I remember being embarrassed about that when I started writing people and saying, "I did a post on that. You should link to." <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of hard. Um, Twitter. I see things on there. I follow those links. If it's a blog I haven't seen before, I'll add it to my RSS feed or and put it onto the sidebar of the list of blogs I, that are there. Um, or if somebody does a post and, and talks about a blog I haven't seen, I'll, I'll do. I'll look for them there. 
I just got a couple more I had seen on a, one of those top 100 lists. And I was like, somehow did I overlook this? There was one on econometrics. I can't think of its name right now that I added to the list that way. But mostly it's just monitoring the feeds that are out there and the Twitter feeds mm-hmm. and the RSS feeds and the, the general discourse. And when something new comes up, add it to the list. And uh, I, I have to tell everyone out there, if you don't have an RSS feed, you're probably not going to get any links from me because I don't have time to go to individual blogs each day. It would just be too, too hard to do it that way. Yeah. And so some people who have truncated their RSS feeds have also probably don't get as much recognition. It's the full feeds that are its most valuable to me. This is the Mark Toma search algorithm. If you want to get seen <laughs> by him, take note. Uh, I'm sorry. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's 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 honest. That's it's it's a grueling job you do, and uh, we, you know we want to make it as efficient as possible for you. So I have to, you know, also note before we move on from our blog discussion that uh, my first blog post was mentioned by you. I was one of those brave souls <laughs> emailed <laughs> you, and this is back in 2007. So I guess August. I think it was August 2007. Um, I had attempted to write an op-ed like you did, and of course it got rejected, and I was actually ripping Jim Cramer mad money. And in retrospect, I think he was actually right. I mean, back in 2007, <laughs> he was going off on the Fed, and I, I called him in my post, I think, a liquidity addict. Um, <laughs> but I, in retrospect, I think he was actually onto something. Um, the, the panic was far worse than anyone had expected, and Cramer was, was making that point. But I wrote this piece kind of going off on him, and uh, no one picked it up in the newspaper, I, I, so I made my own blog. I've been reading yours and others for a few years, and I so what the heck, why don't I just publish it myself on a blog? And you were gracious enough to link to it, and the rest is history. So um, in some small part, we're here today because you took time to recognize my uh, post, so I'm grateful for that. I try to do that, um, especially... People helped me when I started. I wouldn't be here if other people hadn't been willing to say, oh, here's another blog you ought to look at. And it really takes a long time for traffic to build up over time. When you have a post, what I've seen happens is you'll get, you know, several thousand people will come and you think, oh, gosh, I'm there now. But very little of that sticks. You know, maybe 50 of those people will stick and come back the next day. So it takes a concerted effort of other people linking to you over time to, to build up an audience. Yeah, well, that's that's great. I mean, <coughs> blogging is has been fun. It's, it's fascinating, and and uh, we continue to use it as macro economists. Let's move on to some topics now in macro. And a part of your your blogging job is traveling to conferences. I mean, you read almost everything. It seems at least you you get the highlights of the important discussions going on out there. So you're you've been you know covering these topics for a while. So I'm going to run through them with you and get your thoughts on them. Um, Let's begin with a topic that uh, was discussed um, back during you know, the, the crisis, and that was what actually caused the housing boom. Um, there's a number of stories there. The, you know, Fed policy was too easy. There's a saving glut, poor regulatory oversight. Um, lending standards were, were lowered. What is your take based on y- your reading of the literature and all, all these debates? What, what happened that led to the housing boom? I would characterize it a little bit different. All those things played a role. I think at that time there was this big debate about the savings glut and there was a lot of liquidity running around, something you just mentioned. It was looking for a place to park itself. And there was this promise from financial engineering that they had taken taking the, the mortgage markets, they'd sliced and diced mortgages up, you know, things like taking all the first payments of mortgages, let's say 10,000 mortgages, wrapping those up as one financial security and doing all these different ways, you know, taking the second payments from 10,000 mortgages and wrapping those up as a different financial security and selling them. And the first one would have less more less risk than the second one. Of course, when you get out there to 30-year mortgages and that 360th payment and you wrap that up as a financial asset, that's going to be highly risky because there's much more chance that people will have something bad happen and not be able to pay their mortgage over 30 years than there will be in that first month. And that the financial engineers had had this problem, so they had actually um, reduce the overall risk and not just, you know, cause the risk to be shared by a lot more people and disperse that risk. And so I think there was this idea from financial engineering that these mortgages were somehow a safe way 
to park your money because of all the financial engineering. So on the one hand, we had all this excess liquidity running around looking for a place to park itself. We had these financial securities from the housing markets that were paying a little bit more than other securities that were equally rated in terms of their risk. And so all of that money tended to flow into the housing market and just flow downward in a way that allowed the the mortgages to be supported and found. And and, um, so more and more mortgages were being made based upon this money that was coming into the system on this false promise from financial engineering. And I think the regulators were very much unaware of the way in which the risk hadn't really been dispersed. There were all these clauses. The banks thought they'd offloaded a lot of the risk and, you know, it was distributed across the whole world. If the housing market crashed, it wasn't going to cause a big deal. And, um, but there were all these clauses in a lot of these financial instruments that caused that risk to come right back under the bank balance sheet. You know, if the price fell below a certain amount, then the bank was, was, was um, obligated to make good on the, on the, financial security and other sorts of things. And so the risk was, it was much more complicated, I think, than regulators or anyone, anyone realized. And so when the crisis hit, there was a, a, suddenly the risk was concentrated, banks began going down. I think the other place that we really failed from a regulatory point of view was, you know, people look back now and say, we didn't see the crisis coming. Well, that's sort of true and it sort of isn't. People didn't really predict it, but there was a lot of people saying there was a chance. I mean, even Greenspan was, well, you know, we're seeing tiny bubbles, but there's no big bubbles. But even if we had a great big crash, and, and Bernanke said the same thing, it's going to be limited in the financial to the housing market. It won't be a big deal for the rest of the economy. I think that where they didn't really recognize what would happen was the the risk that was posed by a run on the tri, uh, on the repo market. And so I think where regulators really failed was to put the, the, the right safeguards in place so that a run on that repo market wouldn't just destroy financial markets and cause the whole system to, to come crashing down. So moving on to the Great Recession then, you see that it was a, primarily the cause of a financial panic or the, the housing market itself uh, going down? I think it was a combination of both. I think there was a lot of loss of wealth that causes households to um, retrench and wonder what, you know, how the heck they're going to pay for their retirement and their kids' education and all those sorts of things. Unemployment and other things were wiping out whatever assets they had, a lot of households. And so I think some of it was was, was what we'd call a balance sheet effect on, on the household side. Mm-hmm. I, I think the financial market also dried up a lot of the um, – the financial panic and the fear it caused caused investment to to crash for a long time, particularly in housing markets. But I also think it's where uh, it isn't recognized probably enough is it was also right at a time when demographic issues were beginning to become important. China, a few years later, is beginning to slowly slow down. There's a lot of problems in the world market. I think we're also ripe for a correction. And that part of the slow recovery we're seeing is, is exactly that, that the world is undergoing some sort of correction in terms of, you know, we're seeing maybe the possibility of secular stagnation, the demographic effects hitting, the effects of China slowing down and all sorts of uh, those things going on. So I think the financial crisis certainly caused a, a great recession. But I think over time, a lot of other things have played into sort of making the recession last as long as it has and our difficulty recovering and, and the slow economy we're seeing now. So looking back at the Great Recession, particularly how sharp it was, um, you know, the sharpest recession since the Great Depression, and I guess you could consider 1982 as a pretty steep one as well. But yeah, um, do you think it was inevitable? I mean, could the recession of 2007 and 2009 have been a milder one, a garden variety recession, or was it kind of inevitable we're going to have this sharp contraction because of the financial panic tied in with the housing collapse? I don't think it needed to be as sharp as it was. And I think the financial collapse in particular could have been uh, much less had we had the right regulations in the market to sort of um, have a lot more insulation and, and make sure that risk was was more dispersed than it was. And so I, I think that in, if you look back and say, had we known the things we know now, mm-hmm. whether we could have known them then, I, I don't know. That's a different question. But if we knew what we knew now, I think, and put the proper safeguards into effect, I think it could have been a, 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 a 
it didn't have to be as bad as it was. As I said, the, the run on the repo market didn't need to happen the way it happened. We could have had a lot more buffers in terms of, of banks having the kinds of buffers they needed to withstand these sorts of things. And, and we could have done a lot better job at, at regulating risks. The notion that the market, you know, that Greenspan had that we didn't need to regulate markets because, of course, they'll regulate themselves because they have the most interest in, in making sure something like this doesn't happen. That just didn't happen. And even he admits that in retrospect. And so I don't think it needs to be as sharp as it was if, if we'd had the knowledge we have now. So you would have imposed uh, higher capital requirements on banks? Yeah. Okay. Yes, definitely, yeah. as one particular one aspect of it. Yeah, that. that's definitely one that seemed to be missing in retrospect. Well, you and, mentioned the slow recovery, and uh, I, I think you alluded to you know, it being a financial crisis. And there's this kind of view, the Rockoff Reinhardt argument, that financial crises are inevitably um, followed by slow recoveries. There's been some other literature that's come out. I mean, a number of people, including Michael Bordo, have written, who looked historically, and they, they've said, well, not so fast. They can be long protected recoveries, but they not, aren't, necessar- aren't necessarily. It depends on the, res- the policy response. Um, so looking back, um, number one, do you find that a, a plausible uh, argument that our recovery could have been faster had fiscal policy and monetary policy been done differently? So I I think that I I come down on the side that the type of recession matters. And so 82 was a Fed-induced recession for the Mm -hmm. most part. The the Fed can easily lower it. You know, they raise interest rates quickly. They can easily bring them back down and make that thing go away. Uh, I think that financial panics are very difficult to recover from, partly because you know, everyone's, you know, business balance sheets, household balance sheets are all affected and it takes, and it takes a long time to crawl out from the losses that happen when you, when you have a financial panic. And so I I don't think that anything we could have done could have cured it immediately. Could it have been faster? Yes, I very much think it could have been. Um, Particularly, I think fiscal policy is where I would point the finger the strongest that the the move to austerity didn't need to happen. We could have done a lot more. I mean, seven years ago, eight years ago, however long it's been, people were saying, oh, we don't have time to do infrastructure spending because it takes a long time. Well, it's going to be a long recession, everyone kept saying. We have time to do it, but people kept using that as an excuse not to do fiscal policy. And so partly it was the shape fiscal policy was in when we came into the darn thing, we, you know, we already had a lot of debt coming in, and so people were unwilling to do the types of fiscal policy we needed. I, I think that was a wrong thing, but I understand the political implications of, of that that people were were facing. But had fiscal policy reacted more strongly, had we done much more than we did, I, I think that the recession could have been much shorter. When it comes to the Fed, I'm far less critical. I think the Fed's been behind the curve the whole time. Um, they keep wanting to see green shoots just around the corner. We just saw it again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. they, they keep setting this expectation that interest rates are going to go up soon. And I think that's been harmful. But overall, they were very, very creative. When, when the financial crisis hit and markets needed liquidity, they found lots and lots of ways to get around institutional um, roadblocks and roadblocks just from the, the recession itself and found ways to get the liquidity that was needed to stop the recession. I mean, it could have been even worse. We'd say it could have been better, but I also think it could have been even worse than it was. And I give the Fed a lot of credit for the way they creatively created all these different types of policies, these, these different institutions within the Fed to get the liquidity where it needed ways in which they got banks they could loan to, to loan to other people who they couldn't loan to, through these, these various deals and, 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 and that sort of thing. You, you mentioned that Fed policy could have been far worse. We could have had a repeat of the Great Depression, as an example. We didn't have that, so we should be grateful for that. Um, but as you know, I've been critical that the Fed didn't do enough. And maybe I've been too harsh. And I will acknowledge that I'm definitely doing Monday morning quarterbacking here, <laughs> Look, looking back and saying, hey, guys, you should have done this, should have done that. But one thing that, that has bothered me and I found I, I find hard to understand sometimes is the low inflation that's um, 
been with us since the crisis ended. So since mid you know, 2009, we've had core PCE inflation averaging about one and a half percent. And the Fed announced a target in 2012 of two percent. And implicitly before then, it was still aiming for something near two percent. So it seems to have persistently undershot its target. Now, I know there's good excuses at any point in time. The Fed could point to low oil prices, um, different transitory factors. But after almost seven years of what seems to me to be a persistent persistent pattern of uh, low inflation, I have to think there's some kind of revealed preference being shown here or maybe some unconscious desire by the Fed to keep inflation low. Um, I, I wonder if it's tied to something even bigger than the Fed, and that is the body politic wants low inflation. Inflation's been so inflation targeting has been so successful that it's difficult for the Fed. Even if Bernanke or Yellen wanted to temporarily have, say, three, four percent inflation to help spark a robust recovery, they simply couldn't do it. They'd go to Congress, uh, they'd get in trouble there. Voters would be upset. Um, am I providing a fair critique, or am I being too harsh? No, I, I think it's fair. I think the Fed, for one, has treated the 2% as a ceiling rather than an average, and that overshooting would have been a good idea for, for some time period, and they've been very unwilling to do that. When I say unwilling, though, I mean, one of the things I've been surprised about prior to, to the Great Recession, I used to teach my classes, you know, basically say inflation's easy to create. You just print money. But I didn't realize the extent to which that money could simply pile up in banks and, and, and not go out there and create the kind of demand that it needs to create. But uh, on the other hand, I think the Fed could have been more creative and found ways to get that money out of the banks and get it out there, creating the kind of demand you need to, to cause prices to go up. So I, I, I'm with you. I think the Fed was behind the curve a, quite a bit of the time, and that's been a problem. Um, I think they could have done more to create inflation, been more creative with, with the way in which they conducted policy that, that would have done it. Where we probably disagree is that um, I'm not sure the impact would have been very great in terms of investment and in terms of creating um, actual changes in real GDP. So if, if I was going to spend political capital trying to get something to be done, I think fiscal policy has a far greater impact on aggregate demand and on un unemployment and all those sorts of things than the Fed. And so I, I've spent much more of my time being critical of Congress than I have being critical of the people at the Fed. I, you know, for, for the whole, I think, you know, I have a lot of criticism in terms of the particulars of the way they've done things and their timing. But on the whole, I, I think the Fed's done a pretty darn good job. Yeah, you can give them credit for operating in a very difficult environment. I mean, yeah, poor Bernanke has... <laughs> Every time he go to, went up to the Hill, he had a hard time there. People really were harsh. And I remember one time one senator accused him of currency debasement. And Bernanke you know, retorted, hey, we've had the lowest inflation yeah. uh, on record really since the, the Great Depression. So, and I, and I think that one thing I didn't say is that I think the Fed's in a very difficult position. I mean, we had people talking about taking their independence away. And they have to worry not just about their ability to react to this recession, but their ability to act to all future recessions as well. And so if they do things that we all think they should be doing, creating more inflation and the like, and Congress reacts in a way that takes away powers that limits their ability from now into who knows how far into the future, I think that those political consequences are something the Fed really has to think about in a way that all of us as critics don't always understand. And so I think the Fed has been very worried about its political independence as well as what it can do for the economy, and that that's been an important consideration in how they've reacted. And I wish Congress hadn't done what they've done. I mean, I've been critical on fiscal policy. I'd be just as critical in the way they've reacted to the Fed and the kinds of things you're talking about, currency debasement and you know, the, and the fear of inflation that they've put out there and a lot of people and all those sorts of things, I think, have, have tied, the head, tied the Fed's hands in, in a way a lot of people don't understand. Yeah, the, the Fed is supposed to be a flexible inflation targeter, which allows for some overshooting after you have a sharp uh, drop in inflation. Um, so that on average, you have your 2% inflation rate. So what you mentioned earlier you know, the way you hit an average is if you drop below it, then you need to go above it um, and yeah. so they offset each other. And so you know, I want to be clear to our listeners, 
Um, you know, Mark and I are not advocating here a, a case of just wild, reckless inflation. We're talking about something that's more systematic, tied to a flexible inflation target. Um, let me push back just a little bit on, on your fiscal policy uh, idea. And, and let's say the federal government had done more fiscal stimulus spending. Maybe they sent out checks. Maybe it was investment spending. And let's say it did generate some aggregate demand growth and it started to push up inflation and inflation got to 2%. And all of a sudden the Fed begins to panic. Oh no, we're going to be going above 2%. And so they hit the brakes. They offset what fiscal policy is attempting to do. Do you not worry that that might've happened? It could have. Um, but if they're panicking because the economy is doing much better, they're simply trying to now prevent it from overshooting and creating inflation because we're, we're reaching potential output. I'm not too upset by that. Mm -hmm. If then interest rates are higher right now than they otherwise would have been, then we're in much, much better shape if another recession hits because now they've got some room on the downside. I think interest rate policy has a huge impact on the, not a huge impact, but a large impact on the economy, enough to manage on recessions. I think QE has a much, much less impact on the economy. It's much harder to manage the economy. Mm -hmm. So if, if fiscal policy had pushed the economy up to the point where we're creating inflation, which to me wouldn't happen <clears throat> unless we're approaching potential output, and then that caused them to raise interest rates, well, great. Now we're in a much, much better position going forward to curing problems that, the, that might hit the economy. Okay. Well, let's talk about secular stagnation. Um, another factor playing into the effectiveness of policy. And uh, Larry Summers has argued forcefully that we are in the midst of secular stagnation, a perennial shortfall of demand that has led to some atrophy in the economy. And as a consequence, the neutral interest rate has, has dropped, and that makes monetary policy more challenging. Um, do you see this as a good characterization of what's going on? I'm at this point keeping an open mind. I think it's certainly a possibility. I'm not fully convinced that we're not just seeing demographic issues affecting the, the long-term growth rate. Um, I, I think that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, given our infrastructure needs, given that that's probably a good solution to um, secular stagnation and, and, and given the slow recovery, I think it's worth saying, okay, let's just do it as insurance. If we don't really have secular stagnation, then at least we're going to end up with something that's going to help our long-term growth rate in a way I think the economy needs. But I am, I, I, I think it's certainly a possibility. I'm just not fully convinced yet that we're not going to slowly climb out of this. And, and so um, that, that's sort of where I stand. Yeah, you, you had a post uh, a few years ago, and I followed up with something similar. And, and this post was, your post was based on the idea of this endogenous uh, side to potential GDP, right? That we're yes. looking at potential GDP, it's, it's been declining. The CBO's estimates continually seem to march downward. Um, and, and your argument was, well, well, maybe potential GDP would go back up to where it was before the crisis, the, the path it was on if we had more robust aggregate demand growth. Yes, yes. And you start drawing back all these resources that have left, you know, like just think about labor, people who have left the labor market. Looks like it's permanent, but is it really permanent? I don't think we know. And so how many of those resources could be drawn back into productive use as aggregate demand goes back up? And so I think there's a chance that, that some of that will happen, but we need to see the demand first. Yeah, and I think that's difficult. Going back to the earlier critique I had about Fed policy and fiscal policy is that, uh, you know, this commitment to really low inflation, which is normally a good thing, um, is constraining us from ever finding out the answer to that question. <laughs> you yeah. know, can we ever, you know, can we actually generate robust aggregate demand growth when there's this institutional commitment to low, low inflation? And I'm not sure that we can. And I think we probably both share the view that if the Fed wants to, I think inflation is kind of hard to, to create. It's kind of hard for the Fed to create aggregate demand. I, I think there's an asymmetry. I had a paper about this long, long ago. And it, it, but I think the Fed is very, very good at slowing down an overheated economy. Mm -hmm. 
And so this idea that inflation is going to suddenly go out of control, I, I just think is wrong. And so why not push as hard as we can with all types of policy, monetary and fiscal, with all the buttons that we need? If then we're wrong and we're much closer to potential output than we think and we start seeing inflation and, 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 and full employment, and those things, the Fed can take care of it. So, so I, I just don't see that there's a huge risk in pursuing that kind of a policy. I would add to that that we could also do this within a framework of level targeting, whether it's price level targeting or nominal GDP level targeting, which would provide a, a constraint, kind of a, a, you know, some, uh, a rule that would allow us to try this robust aggregate demand growth without unanchoring the long run price level path. Um, but that too would be a radical departure from what we're doing now. So um, I, I'm, I'm not hopeful that, you know, we're going to get back or undo the uh, economic atrophy that we've seen, arguably have seen in the economy. The 70s did a lot of damage. <laughs> the inflation of the 70s did a lot of damage to people. There's people that are still really worried that that's mm -hmm. going to happen again. And a lot of that was oil prices and other sorts of things that had nothing to do with monetary policy. So I just think the fears and a lot of the people in control of the Fed and you know politicians and like, we all lived through that time period. It's, it's in our minds and we just can't let that happen again. But I, the, the idea that that was solely due to, to poor monetary policy, I think is partly, I just think that's wrong. And monetary policy could have done better during that time period. But I think the fear that we're going to suddenly have the 1970s over again and interest rates that are up, you know, 17, 18% and that kind of thing. I just don't think that's going to happen. The Fed has learned a lot since then. They don't conduct policy the way they conducted policy in those days. They understand things they didn't understand. And so those risks, I don't think are there. Yeah. And again, I think we could try this within a, a, an approach that would prevent that from ever happening again. Yes. Uh, with level targeting. Um, along those same lines of st secular stagnation, Larry Summers, uh, Robert Gordon has come out with a similar but slightly different argument. And his view is that we've come to the end of the big innovations, that, uh, you know, all the great inventions, you know, the practical in life-changing inventions, they're with us. And all the technology we see, they're on the margin. They aren't having the same kind of impact on productivity growth. And so we're, we're going to see a, a permanent, you know, productivity growth slowdown. Um, how do you take that argument? Um, I don't want to believe it. <laughs> I'm a technology optimist. I think the digital mm -hmm. revolution and all of the things we're learning are going to make great differences, not only just for the economy, but for people's lives. Maybe not the same kind of thing as you know the invention of electricity or, or plumbing or those sorts of things. But I think some of the things we're seeing in healthcare and, and um, other sorts of things – robots and other sorts of things are going to make a huge difference in terms of, the, of how we produce goods and services and what we're able to do. And so I'm much more optimistic that we're simply in a bit of a lull as we learn how to use all of these things um, rather than we're in a long run permanent slowdown. And so I have a lot of hope for the future rather than a lot of pessimism. As I look back through history, this idea that the economy is eventually going to stagnate, it goes back to Ricardo and everyone else that, that you know, we're, we're out of good ideas and someday we're going to hit this, this stationary state where we just, you know, there's no more growth in the economy. And that just never happened for hundreds and hundreds of years. And I just don't think it's going to happen again. But I do think we're in a bit of a lull. I do think, as I've said earlier, there's demographic things mm -hmm. going on. They're going to affect our long-term growth rate. But I, I am just, I'm just not the pessimist that others are on this score. I'm with you on that. I definitely think um, there's innovations going on right now that will make a big difference over the next decade. I also, I think I'm going to say, I think yeah. there's distributional issues in terms of who owns the robots, who owns the mm -hmm. self-driving cars and, and that sort of thing that the society is going to have to grapple with. But in terms of the underlying ability to produce goods and services, I'm not so worried about that. What about the issue of mismeasurement of GDP? So a, a lot of the uh, new technology um, is not being counted. So if you look at your smartphone, for example, there's a number of apps on there that would formerly would have been part of GDP. You're um, you go get your encyclopedia off your phone, you get maps off your phone, you get music. Many of those things are free or very low cost. Previously, they would have been counted as a part of GDP. Do you think any part of the slowdown is tied to this mismeasurement issue? I think it is. And I have to, though, 
tell everyone that the recent research that's come out that's tried to measure that effect through various ways simply hasn't been very supportive of that idea. Nevertheless, there's just a part of me that says that's true. I mean, when I think about my own life, just simple things like not having to take out a map or always knowing where I am, having the whole encyclopedia of the world Mm -hmm. with me wherever I go, I can take all of my classes and put them on my cell phone, (laughs) you know, with, with video lectures and that sort of thing. I mean, there's just all these things that I can do that I couldn't do long ago that, that I think make a huge difference in the way I conduct my life. And so, I think there is something to that, that again, when we've tried to measure that, it hasn't found a lot of support in the research. Yeah. I've, I've come across that recent research too, and I've been surprised by it. It's been, yeah. cause they've looked at cross country, not just the U S and they find, um, you know, that the mismeasurement issue may not be that big, but there's a part of me who wants to push back against that. Cause I, I think um, maybe at some point we'll find out differently. Intuitively, I just feel differently, but, you know, yeah. if the research is the research. Right. <laughs> well, I guess we'll have to dig into the research ourselves and, 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 and uh, find <laughs> out the holes in it. Um, what about the safe asset shortage problem? I, I, this is an issue near and dear to my heart. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Is this a real issue? Do you think it explains the decline in um, long-term bond yields? Just today on Twitter, I got into an exchange with someone about whether there is financial repression going on. And I made the case that the central banks are intervening. There are negative rates um, now, but all of those are symptomatic of a deeper underlying process of, of there being safe asset shortage, that the demand for those are growing. For some of the reasons you mentioned already, demographics, I might also, also add uncertainty and, and the lack of, of you know, rapid recovery. Um, do you do you see the safe asset shortage problem as a legitimate uh, problem and and one that needs to be resolved? Yeah, I do. Um, and I think I would add what you just add that it partly it's a result of people trying to park their money in a safe place, and that's partly due to the fear that's out there and the inability to find investments that people are confident in, willing to take a risk in, and so. It's partly due to us this this non appetite for risk because we're, there, people aren't able to to find the types of investments they'd historically like to make and take any risks with their money. Maybe that's a result of inequality and too many people having so much they don't need to do that. I don't know, but you know if you look out there with people just trying to use safe assets as a way to back international transactions. Barry Eichengreen had a Project Syndicate piece about that just this week. You know they're finding it very difficult to to conduct certain types of international transactions because the kind of collateral you need, which is usually in things like T bills, just isn't out there. And so there's a lot of reasons to think that yes, there is a safe ad, um, there is a safe asset shortage out there, and that's partly what's driving down the the, the long term yields and driving up the prices, as, as you've said. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, and as the uh, monetarist in me likes to point out the safe asset shortage is really a money shortage, right? As as you just said, these safe assets are used in transaction purposes often for institutional investors. And so it's really, at the end of the day, a shortage of institutional money assets. And that's just lowering transaction and ultimately lowering uh, uh, demand. And interestingly enough, you know, um, this would be one way that fiscal policy could really help. I'm just going to add that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, so you've been talking about the spending, you know, side of fiscal policy. I like to look more at the let's supply safe assets side of fiscal policy. And again, within a rules-based kind of constrained framework, but I, I do think this is an area. And it's also one that it's it's tough sometimes to wrap our minds around because if you look at all these yields that have been falling across the world for safe assets, Germany, UK, the US, you know, Switzerland, Canada, Australia, um, these are all the countries with safe assets and their yields have, have persistently been falling since the crisis. And it, it says to me that the world is, is saying to these countries, we want more of your debt. Um, you know, there used to be a joke back in the early to mid 2000s when I was reading your blog and following. If you recall back then, we were concerned about the dollar having a, a crash, right? That it was overvalued, yeah, yeah. huge current account deficits. And I was all on board like, yeah, we're going to have this problem. We need to fix it. But in That's retrospect, I, I think we were wrong. The world was you know, clamoring for uh, dollar and dollar-denominated assets. 
And the joke back then was, well, our comparative advantage is exporting debt. We're good at creating debt, and we get a good laugh out of that. But I, I think there's some truth to that. We have the deep capital markets. We have relatively good institutions. And we just have the capacity to create these safe assets like no one else. Now, Germany can do it. The UK can do it. But they're smaller, and there's some limit to what they can do. And surely there's a limit to what we can do, too. But uh, we are the, you know, the last option on the planet. I mean, and you mentioned earlier the, the liquidity looking for a home during the housing boom. That, that's another symptom of this. Um, and also when the crash hit, everyone expected yep. the dollar to, to go down. Instead, what happened is all this international money came to the U.S. in search of, of treasury bills as a safe place to park their money until they figured out what the heck was going on. And uh, I think that's still going on. Yeah, definitely an, an interesting story. And one that, again, it's, it's, it's tough to wrap our minds around because it implies, among other things, that you know, some of the run-up in debt that we had over the past seven, eight years was as much or at least partly traced to this demand from the world. Um, we like to put the blame at Congress or the president, but you know, to some extent what they're doing is endogenous to this global appetite for our safe assets. Um, and the, the fear in Congress has always been interest rate spikes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the fear. That's the big fear of debt. You can have these big interest rate spikes. But if this is true, that's just not going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something we want to think about um, when, when doing you know, po fiscal policy. You know, what is our true debt capacity? Um, I, I do think long term we have some issues with unfunded liabilities. But I think in the near term, we need to look closely at the safe asset shortage problem and see what does it mean for our debt capacity. And, and do a much better job when times are good of getting ourselves into the kind of fiscal position right. where we, can, we can do the things that we need to do when times are bad. You know, we, we were in the situation of cutting taxes and creating debt during the, when we thought it was a good times, not a, not a housing boom, it was a bit of a false promise. You know, it, we, instead of building up the kind of reserves we needed to have the space to do these things, instead we were cutting taxes and doing doing exactly what we didn't need to be doing. And so, I think I think as economists we need to put more pressure on Congress to say, look, you know, there's a way to do this to to manage cycles that you need to be re, you know you need to be responsible and, and be aware of. Okay, okay. We, have, we have a few minutes left. I want to go to some of your research I've been holding off, but some really fascinating work that you've done on the political business cycle. Can you tell us what is a political business cycle and what have you learned about it? Um, yeah, this is quite a while ago now, but it, it's the notion that um, as you approach elections, either monetary or fiscal policy will be used to stoke the economy in a way that will make it more likely that you get reelected. And so if you're an incumbent, in, it, it, you may use fiscal policy measures to make the economy look better. Or if you had control of the money supply, you may lower interest rates or in the old days, increase the money supply, trying to make the economy look better. And if you look at the lags that are out there, for, for instance, with monetary policy, the way it might work is that the effect on real output seems to happen faster than the effect on inflation. So what you could do is increase the money supply, cut interest rates, have unemployment go down for the election, if you, if you time it right, and not see the negative part that voters are going to hate the inflation until after you're already elected. And then promise yourself that, gee, once, once we get past the election, what we'll do is we'll then bring the money supply back down so that we don't, we don't see the inflation, which, you know, that's like promising you'll, you'll go running tomorrow after you've eaten cake today. That, that promise doesn't, right. seem, doesn't seem to be, but, but it, it not be a conscious thing. So in a, in a, with an independent Fed, it may just be that the Fed is so worried as you approach an election about doing something negative that might negatively affect the economy that they tend to have a bias towards ease as you approach elections. You know, maybe we'll see that as we approach this election with the Fed. They, they, they claim and claim they're not, they, they don't do this, that they, they're going to do what they think is right. But, but maybe that's not quite true. Maybe what they're, they're really worried about is if they raise interest rates too fast as the election approaches, they could get blamed for hmm. creating consequences that will affect the election. And that's a lot of they want to do when political viability is, is where it is at, at these days. So it's more of an unconscious um political yeah. business cycle. Now, there, there have been a, a few cases, at least one I'm, I'm well aware of, 
um, Arthur Burns and Richard Nixon, didn't he allegedly help uh, ease uh, monetary policy to get Richard Nixon elected? Yep, yes. Uh, okay. But in general, the, when we think of political business cycles, is this more of a phenomenon overseas, or do you, we find it in advanced economies as well? Well, when we looked at our work, and again, this has been 10 years ago, we went into what's called the frequency domain and looked for four-year cycles in monetary and fiscal policy. And in money supply, you could actually find what looked like a fairly strong four-year cycle in the way policy was conducted. So it looked like, and whether it was direct or indirect or for whatever reason, it looked like, at least in the past, and I haven't really updated this work since then, but at least in the past, there was some evidence of, of these sorts of four-year cycles being stronger than other sorts of cycles you could find in the data. Well, our guest today has been Mark Toma. Mark, thank you for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.